Amen, brothers and sisters. It's good to see you. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Um, I'm going to need some good understanding because that's not the verse that I want. It was 1 Corinthians 8 2. And uh, I'm sure that's my mistake. But, anyways, it sort of fits part of it. But if you could turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 8 2. Y'all get there to say amen. 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 2. Are we there? And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. And if you're paying attention, the last time I was here, that was the scripture I used also. Because I want to, I want this this point to solidify in our minds that uh, when we come to scripture, if we come from this attitude, like a child, of that we don't know anything, then maybe, just maybe, we might learn something. Instead of, as it says in 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 1, Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we, that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifies. What does that mean? Love. Love. Right? So what's the title of our speech today, our little talk? Unity comes at a price. Do you believe that's true? Let us turn to Matthew then, in verse 5 and 21. This will be a very simple talk. This isn't uh, difficult. This will be very easy to grasp. It's sad to see that our numbers are so down. And I understand that the church is going through a transitional period and um, but we don't follow a man, we follow Christ. And this is his church. And so we shouldn't let anything or anybody keep us from it. Right? Matthew 5 and verse 21. We all there? Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way first, be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. There's some important counsel there, isn't there? God is saying, what? How can you love me whom you can't see? Right? If you can, you can't even love your brother, who you can see. Do think? Do people do things that upset us and anger us? Never. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And we should, uh, we should be willing to overlook a fault. I think we shouldn't be so quick to judge people. And some people are quick to judge, and some people are quick be offended. And I think that in a family, we have to learn to love one another. We have different personalities, different likes and different dislikes, right? If we're going to be unified and have this unity, which I'm trying to say today that comes at a price, then we have some lessons to learn, don't we? We need to, brothers and sisters, have that upper room experience. Have I got your attention? Everybody hearing me? Yeah. Okay. I want to make sure we're all awake this morning. So 
why do we need this upper room experience? Did the, did the disciples need the upper room experience? Didn't they spend three and a half years with the master? Living with him. Hearing everything that he had to say. Eating with him. And yet, what happened? Did they have unity? Or did they fight amongst themselves? But who would be greater? Right? Hmm. I wonder why there's so many empty spots in the pew today. Could it be some of this? Maybe it's pride. I don't know. What is it that keeps us from being unified? See, I, when I got this appointment to, to preach down here, I, I began to pray right away what the Lord wants me to talk about. What is it that New Smyrna Beach needs? And I just felt overwhelmed with unity. Unity. This is what we need. Right here at this church, we need to have that upper room experience. We need to lay our junk down at the altar. We're here to worship God, right? This isn't just a social gathering. If that's all it is, then you're not going to stay. That's not what it's about. Can I get any amens? Maybe. Amen. All right. Let's Matthew five and forty-eight. Let's go to Matthew five and forty-eight. It's real easy. We're already in Matthew five. What does it say? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Wow, that's a pretty big calling, isn't it? Be ye perfect? Would God ask you to do something that he didn't believe that you were capable of doing? So do you believe that you can be perfect? That word, is, that word means complete. The word means complete. Yeah. Actually, the strong definition says complete. Okay. Is, uh, Perfect means complete. Of labor, growth, mental, or moral character. Okay. And the companion verse for that, and the, and the, the, back, the greatest sermon ever told, which was where we did just that, is Matthew 5, right? In verse 48. The companion verse to that in Luke is Luke chapter 6 and verse 36. And it reads, therefore, Be ye therefore merciful... As your Father in heaven also is merciful. So to be perfect is also to be merciful. What does it mean to be merciful? Does it mean possibly that we are to forgive faults Amen. of our brothers and sisters? Maybe even overlook a fault. Maybe even this directed directly at you. If we look in Luke, are we at Luke 5? Luke 5. Luke 5 and 29. Are we there? Luke 5 and 29. And Levi made him a great feast in his own house. And there was a great company of publicans and others that sat down with them. But their scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, Why do ye eat and drink with publicans and sinners? And Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but that they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Are we all righteous? Or are we all sinners? In Christ we're righteous. In Christ we're righteous. So if I'm righteous in Christ, then I'm looking outside of myself, correct? Okay. But if I'm looking inside myself, then I'm puffed up. I'm, I'm all that, ain't I? I'm looking at you, 
And I think you're not all that, because you can't be, because I'm all that, right? Oh, Hello? Why do we have these attitudes against one another? We're, we're called to love one another. I, I just don't understand. Some people have a very difficult time just driving their car. And they're Christians. They're mad at everybody. The moment they leave the driveway. How's that possible? How's that possible? I don't understand. Brothers and sisters, we need to learn to follow Christ. Amen. And to follow Christ means death to self. Mm -hmm. Death to self. That's what an upper room experience is all about. You know, the flesh cannot be converted. If the flesh could be converted, there would be no reason for Christ Jesus to die. Jesus said the flesh must be crucified. He took your flesh and my flesh to the cross. Amen. And he nailed it. And, and I want to tell you, he nailed it. Because nobody else did. When you're talking about the omniscient one, the one who knows all science, there's no mystery. He laid down his hands, okay, and he allowed them to crucify him. Nobody took his life. He gave it. Amen? Amen. So, let's turn to Luke 6. Chapter 6 and 45. Chapter 6 and 45. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, bringeth forth that which is for of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not things and do not the things which I say? Is, your, is this a red letter edition Bible? Do you, do you, what, do you, what do you got here? Who's talking? Jesus. Jesus. Whosoever cometh to me and hear my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built a house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it. For it was founded upon a rock. Is this any rock? No. This is the rock. But he that it heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built a house upon the earth against which the stream, stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Hmm. What's the focus here, brothers and sisters? Built on the rock. Built upon the rock. Not upon <laughs> your brother or your sister or any other vehicle but upon the rock, Jesus Christ. I was sat next to a man on the plane here that we got out of JFK, me and I. And him and I had a nice little talk. And uh, he asked me, well, what's a good church to go to? Because he was flying in Daytona. And I said, New Smyrna Beach. <laughs> <laughs> and we had a nice talk. And uh, we talked about present truth. And he, uh, I gave him a lot to think about, let me tell you. Because uh, I, I, I'm not going to get into all that. But anyways, it was a blessed um, union that we had, flying and talking on the way from JFK down here. And uh, I praise God. He always puts me in positions where I get a chance to talk to people and plant seeds, because that's what I am. I'm a seed planter, and I'm an encourager. And I love to plant seeds. And some of you are waterers. And you need to come up behind me and pour water on them seeds that I planted. 
You know, we all have different positions in the church. Every position is integral in the in the part of growing up a healthy church. You know, something that I hope, and, 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 you know, as we transition, we have a new pastor that's coming in. Okay, so some people may have some some ideas about this guy, or maybe. We have to have an open mind, okay? We have to act as though we know nothing so that we can begin to learn, right? This guy, I'm sure, has something to teach us. He's not John, obviously, no. And, you know, it's like a substitute teacher. A poor substitute teacher comes in and they say, well, you're not John. You don't do this. And you did. John never made us sit in this chair. He didn't do that or whatever. That's ridiculous. It's childish. Okay? We need to grow up. Amen. Grow up and act like adults. And see where God is leading us. There's a new day in New Smyrna. Okay? We're following Jesus Christ. I don't want to take anything away from John. I love John. Okay? But God's called him somewhere else. And this church must go on. And I wonder why some of the pews are so empty. People are out of town. Well, I wonder if they're all just out of town. I, I know. I hold a few. The last time I was here, it was like this, too. So, I don't know. Anyways, I'm not judging anybody. I'm leaving it up to God. I'm asking you guys not to judge anybody. Let's love one another, right? That's where unity comes from. What we're talking about here today is that upper room experience. Listen, it's a hard lesson to learn to die to self. It's easy to go to Africa and give things away and do this and do that and just keep your, your body busy doing great things. But it's a lot harder, brothers and sisters, to die to self. <laughs> Dying to self is a very difficult thing. You know, I, I got a lot of things in my life that I have to die to. And it's a daily struggle. And I swear that I think that my back trouble that I have, God has given me as a thorn in the flesh because it just never seems to give up. I mean, getting down and getting up is always seems to be painful. I mean, you know, I get a couple days a month where I don't have pain. And you know what? Those couple days a month, there's nobody that can rain on my parade because I feel so good when I'm not in pain. It, it's just amazing. I mean, I got a smile that rips from ear to ear, and you just can't take it off my face, even if you try. That's what we need to be like as Christians. Constantly. That kind of attitude. Because we follow Christ. Do you realize that He has done everything that needed to be done? Everything. He's made you rich beyond your wildest dreams, yet we, we, we're, we're happy here. In this dark world. I don't think we really want to go home. I'm tired of hearing. Evangelical speech. In the Adventist church. That talks about how we're just. We're going home because there's an earthquake. In, in San Juan. Or there's this that and the other thing. It, what, where do you read your Bible. And say that that's it. The Bible says. That there needs to be a people. For God to come to. Okay? And that's you and I. We need to have a people that are ready to receive Him. And Jesus can't come until that happens. You know, when He had 12 guys that shine like that diamond I'm talking about, the church that God is calling forth and said will come at the end of time. And I don't know when that is, but I hope it's very soon. I'm not going to sit here and tell you it's very soon. There's a lot of disturbing things that happen in the world. And I'm very disturbed, and I don't want to get into politics, but I'm very disturbed when somebody who's the leader of a country is getting into arguments of whether somebody kneels or doesn't kneel for the flag. Listen, the beauty of being an American, brothers and sisters, is that we have the right to be wrong, and real freedom means what? It means real freedom. That means something that somebody can do that I completely disagree with is their right and freedom. Or what do we have? Listen, it's very scary when you have the evangelical world grabbing the ear of a president in at least a weekly basis. I mean meetings every week. 
and we're talking a big entourage, and what do you think they're chewing on his ear about? Separation of wall of church and state needs to be done away with. That's what they think. That's what they're encouraging him to believe. But that is not what we need. Does God, does God force you into anything? Does God make you do anything? Brothers and sisters, it's scary. It's scary what's going on. But I didn't even want to get into that. We are following Jesus Christ. We are people of another planet, another world, a heavenly. We're, we are not of this world, brothers and sisters. Citizens of New Jerusalem. Citizens of New Jerusalem. And we need to be ambassadors of that New Jerusalem. How can we do that if we're fighting amongst ourselves? Listen, the world couldn't stand those 12 disciples. For how long did they, they put up with it? I mean, they were all killed, brothers and sisters. They didn't die natural deaths. Why is that? <coughs> Jesus didn't die a natural death. Why is that? When he has a people that are ready to receive him, like those 12 disciples, the world will not be able to stand it. Every heart will have made its decision. And God will not be able to, to wait another, another moment. He even said when he was here, he says, if I had brought up the dead, it wouldn't change your decision. There will come a point in time when he has that church, okay? Every decision is made. It wouldn't matter what God did. You would not change your mind. Amen? Amen. Let us go to 6 and 39. 6 and 39 of Luke. And he spake a parable unto them. Can the blind lead the blind? Shall they both fall into the ditch? The disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. What does that mean? Everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. Is Jesus the prototype? Is he your master? If he's your master and you're walking with him and you're not focused on what your brother is doing or isn't doing, you know what's going to happen? You're going to become changed. You are going to become changed. And there's going to be people that are going to be jealous and they're going to want what you got. And you know what you're going to do? You're going to point to Jesus. Because he is what you're all about. I hope you get an amen on that. In verse 41. And, wh and why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but perceivest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Either how cast thou say to thy brother, Brother, let me pull out the moat out of thine eye, when thou thyself beholdest not the beam that is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, cast out first the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to pull out the moat that is in thy brother's eye. Do we get this, brothers and sisters? For every tree is known by his own fruit. For a thorn men do not gather figs, nor of a bramble brook bush, Gather they grapes. What is this saying? A good tree gives good fruit, right? Does it toil and spin? Does a bad free tree give good fruit? No, it doesn't. Is this rocket science? This is easy stuff, isn't it? Let us turn to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy in chapter 3. Second Timothy in chapter 3. Y'all there? Anybody there yet? Alright. So let's start in verse 1. 
This know also that the la that in the last days, in the last days, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of them, their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, with unnatural affection, truth fake breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God. Do we have this going on today? Do you know what happens when you take a you take a sapling, okay, a sapling tree, and you begin to bend it when it's very young, and you can twist it and do it, make it grow whatever way you want it to grow. But is that normal for that tree to be twisted and turned? No, no it isn't. But as the tree grows, it believes that that's normal, doesn't it? Doesn't it? How are